station and everyone, the whole crew there. And this is what we're talking about today, high temperature superconductors. And why, if we learn how to make better superconductors, they'll transform our world. So um, as, I, as Kirsten said, I'm part of the National Mag Lab facility and FSU. And I'm also part of the Center for Emergent Superconductivity. And what we worry about is using superconductivity to carry energy across with like the power grid. And this is what we call SMEZ, which is, um, <laughs> hello, tell them to be quiet. Okay. <laughs> and this is what we call SMEZ, superconducting magnetic energy storage. And it's basically just like a wire around in a toroid, and you can save energy that way. And we also have here wind turbines. And if we could make better superconductors going through the periodic table of the elements and understanding how the electrons move better into these materials and make better superconductors, this will transform our lives. And by the time I'm done, I'll give you a quiz now, and you'll understand all this. So why superconductivity? What is superconductivity? So I'll tell you what that is first. And then I'm going to tell you why better superconductors, and what I mean by better superconductors, will make our lives better. I'd like to talk about the history of superconductivity and the discovery. And the discovery was not a predictive discovery. It was luck. And I will stress that to you and why we still need that kind of research going on. But part of my research that I will continue doing here is how can we ever learn to design new superconductors, which at present is impossible. Um, so uh, I'll talk about some of the applications and how we're supposed to do it. And I may not get to this at the end, but how my own research will help us in this new materials discovery. So what is a superconductor? A superconductor has two properties. One is that it transmits electrical energy without energy loss. With, that's called zero electrical resistance. Okay? And the other thing is that it's a perfect anti-magnet. We call that diamagnetism. And it's very weird. And I will show you why this is very different than a regular conductor. What I'm going to show you the now, a normal metal, as you lower the re temperature, the resistance gets lower. A superconductor, the resistance falls abruptly to zero. How strange is that? And then the other thing, this anti-magnetism, which I'll talk about in the next slide or two, is that if you send a magnetic field into a superconductor, it spits it out. It hates it. It abhorbs any kind of magnetic field. Now, no superconductor superconducts at room temperature. To date, every superconductor has to be cooled, and it has to be cooled a lot. And here's some temperature scales just to remind you. I know Tim and other people have given you these scales before, but what we're used to thinking of here in the United States is the Fahrenheit scale, where ice, which has been in that way lately around here, is at 32 degrees. Um, and then if we go down to liquid air or liquid nitrogen, that's minus 390, and absolute zero is like over 450 degrees below zero. Now, in low temperature, and then there's the centigrade scale, which you may have heard about. And in, unless you work in a hospital, then you call it centigrade, which I never figured out. Um, and there, um, zero is freezing, and minus 273 is what we call absolute zero. Now, these are not what we call thermodynamic temperature scales. Because if you go outside, and whether you're talking about Fahrenheit or centigrade, and it's really cold, it's so cold, it's zero degrees outside. Zero degrees. But tomorrow's going to be twice as cold. OK, that, that doesn't make any sense. So what we do is we come up with a scale that you could multiply the temperatures together. And that's the Kelvin scale. It's thermodynamic. In that case, zero is zero. Zero, if you go out in the middle of space, away from everything, you're very close to absolute zero. Not quite. We have the Big Bang, which gives us three degrees in the background. It did happen. I'm um, sorry. But um, it, that's a thermodynamic scale. Now, all superconductors have to be cold. What I call the conventional superconductors had to be cooled down to very cold temperatures, like four degrees to 10 degrees to 30 degrees above absolute zero. What was very exciting with the high temperature superconductors is they could be cooled to like 100 degrees above absolute zero. Why is that important? To get to those very, very cold temperatures, it's difficult. And I'll show you some of the difficulty the camera Lagonas had in getting there. But you have to use something called liquid helium. And it's very, very expensive, and it's very hard to use. 
my last university, we were paying between $15 and $20 a liter, and to cool down one of my cryostats, it could take 50 liters. It's really expensive. Now, liquid air, which now the high temperature superconductors can be cooled with, it's just liquid nitrogen, liquid air, you can pour it on the floor. I was gonna bring some, but it violated some safety rules, so come visit me in the lab. <laughs> come to open house, we'll have great demos. Um, but this is really cheap, it's like 20 cents a liter. So it's cheaper than milk, I mean, it's cheaper than beer. So that's, <laughs> so if we look at the history, and I'm gonna talk a lot about history too, because you know, physicists are natural philosophers, we like music, hi husband. Um, we like music and history and humanities, and so we'll do a lot of historical things here. And this is one of the many, many plots of TC versus time. TC is critical temperature. Above that critical temperature, it's not a superconductor. Below that critical temperature, it is a superconductor. And I'll show you that Kamerlich Onis, in 1911, discovered that mercury was a superconductor. And there were many discoveries, and what we have here is plotting the temperature below which you have to go to make something superconducting, and what year it was discovered. So this is the highest TC material discovered in that year. And it looks like what happened in 1986, a whole revolution happened. And that's the revolution of high temperature superconductivity. It, many of the people in this room and many of my colleagues and me, it changed my life. It was the most wonderful, exciting thing to, we'll get a few beers in me, I'll tell you some of the stories, it's really fantastic. But one thing I'll get across before I'm done with this talk, and I'll tell you first right now, and I'll say it again later, is that there are many superconductors that aren't on this red line here. This red line and everything is red is what we call a conventional superconductor. And that's one of the two problems in what we call correlated electron physics. That means you gotta use quantum mechanics to describe it. And as Richard Feynman says, no one understands quantum mechanics, one just gets used to it. And what happens, and I will show you, is that these electrons at actually pretty high temperatures start skipping together, doing things that we don't know why, and they correlate over pretty long distances. And that's what's under understood. But what we do understand is that when we go below this critical temperature and the things are superconducting, that's understood, okay? We even have mean field equations to describe the properties, the transport, the optical, we can do that. So, uh, but exactly, we can describe the properties, but exactly why they superconduct, everything that's not one of these red dots here, we can't explain. And let me tell you that I have many, many families of superconductors I haven't put on here. So all of the high temperature superconductors and many of these other correlated electron superconductors, we don't know how they work. And that's the focus of my work. Now what does zero electrical resistance mean? Let's consider, this is a space heater, which I understand that some of you have actually seen before in this room. I came from, you know, Illinois, so we know space heaters. So if everything is working correctly in your space heater, when you plug it into the wall, the current goes through the copper wire, and the coils, if you unplug it and let it cool down and make sure it's unplugged, the coils are hard and black and stiff. These, this is a material that's designed to be very resistive. So when the, same, when the current goes through the low resistance copper wire, there's not much loss, there's not much resistance. In physics, the power loss goes as I squared R, it's proportional to the resistance. If it's a high resistance, there's a lot of power dissipation that gets hot. And that hard, crinkly wire, it's like the electrons can't get through, it's like rubbing your hands together, right? Instead of rubbing on something soft, smooth and it really feels this resistance. Now, a copper wire is low resistance, so there's little heat dissipation. The heater wires are designed to have high resistance so they get very hot. A superconductor, if everything's working, has zero electrical resistance. So if you have a light bulb here, and a battery in Southern California, and it's connected by superconducting wires, that light bulb will light. No energy loss no power dissipation. So, that's pretty cool, but it's not just a perfect conductor. There's something really creepy in there. It's a superconductor, which is distinctly different than a perfect conductor. 
And what this diagram here is to show you the difference between a perfect conductor and a superconductor. Now, this is an example of a perfect conductor. First, you put a magnetic field on it at high temperature above its critical temperature when it's conducting like a regular piece of metal. And that's the magnetic field. Let's say we lower the temperature, thunk, below the perfect conductor's critical temperature. So now it's a classically really great conductor. Mr. Maxwell and his equations told us that if something is a perfect conductor, those magnetic field lines get stuck and you can't move them out. Okay, she can drop off some food. Okay. <laughs> um, and in fact, if you stay at that low temperature and you take off the external field, those field lines are stuck and the final state is in fact looks like a little magnet. A superconductor does something completely different. This was discovered by someone named Meissner and a student, a student named Aschenfeld. But we don't call it the Meissner-Aschenfeld effect, we call it the Meissner effect. So if you know any graduate students, tell them to get their PhD and get out so they can start getting credit. Um, anyhow, this Meissner effect that was discovered in the 1920s, if you put a field in the superconductor above its superconducting transition temperature, and then you lower it to below its critical temperature, the field lines aren't stuck. They're spit out, literally thrown out. And the result is when you take the magnetic field off, you don't have a magnet. So the, you take two materials, a perfect conductor and a superconductor, and you put them through the same processes and your final state is different. That's a proof that a superconductor is fundamentally different than a perfect conductor. And it's this quantum mechanical uh, Meissner effect. This quantum mechanical Meissner effect, and I'd like to talk about this, but I won't have a lot of time in this talk, it proves that there's long range quantum mechanical order. So inside of a superconductor, those electrons are really holding hands over very long distances. The typical length scale in a metal is like an angstrom. In a superconductor, it could be microns. Okay, it could be 10 to the third to 10 to the five times longer. And what happens is instead of, on, in like if this, this pointer were a piece of metal here, each electron is going to act like a little wave. You may have heard that. And they're unrelated. If this were a superconductor and I lowered it down to below its superconducting transition temperature, I don't have all these little electrons acting like little waves. They all form into one wave. That's the BCS theory of superconductivity. I don't need 10 to the 26 waves to describe it. I need one wave. They fall into a single quantum mechanical state, macroscopic. And I'll show you some examples coming up. But it is really cool, right? I mean, all of a sudden, you have quantum mechanics on as large a scale as you want. Now, this perfect diamagnetism works because, in fact, the electrons move without any resistance and a cartoon and by the way I want to tell you that I use a lot of analogies in these talks and just to warn the experts all analogies break down if you push them too far so for instance may you be heard of the Bohr model of the atom where you've got these little electrons like planets around the Sun completely wrong okay <laughs> but we teach it and we use it because it helps us understand it so I'm just warning you for some of the experts in any case if you put a superconductor on top of a magnet, as I mentioned to you, the field gets thrown out. And that's the perfect diamagnetism. What happens is that the electrons start moving around the surface and making a magnetic field that points in the opposite direction. And that causes superconductors to float. So, um, and I'll show you that, but before I show you that, I want to show you something that's very interesting, which is that there's two kinds of super, there's two kinds of people, no, there's two kinds of superconductors. There's type one superconductors and type two superconductors. I bet oh. that surprised you, yeah, okay. So it turns out that type two superconductors are good superconductors. They're the ones that are practical. And they do expel magnetic fields, but because of some intrinsic length scales, if you put them in a large enough field, you don't necessarily kill all the superconductivity you can actually have the magnetic field penetrate 
in little places, and it causes vortices of supercurrent around there. So these areas here, around this vortex, around this magnetic field line that's penetrating the surface, you have supercurrents running around. Now this is very important to understand this one point here. Inside of that vortex where the magnetic field goes through, it's not superconducting. Those pink lines aren't superconducting. So if that vortex is free to move, it's going to move the inside of it, which is non-superconducting, so it's going to dissipate energy. So a key understanding in these type two superconductors, the ones that can maintain high fields, that are practical, you have to figure out a way to pin those vortices. So that will lead us to something here, which is if you want to make something levitate, superconductors work great. So I have an example here, and I, I do have the demonstration somewhere, but I'll just show you here. Here's an example. Maybe you've done this yourself. Oh, sorry. I hit the wrong button here. I have to go back to here. Nobody's perfect. So uh, come back, come back. So this is a high temperature superconductor that's immersed in a little bowl of liquid nitrogen, and this is a very strong magnet. And look how well that's holding on there, okay? That's holding on so strongly because it has vortices that are pinned in there. Now, if you try to float two magnets, two permanent magnets on top of each other, you can't do it without making some special braces or doing some other special things because, in fact, two permanent magnets are unstable. It's called Harshaw's theorem. So if you want to make something like a levitated train, superconductors are a good idea. In fact, this is an example of a high temperature superconducting maglev train in Japan, and it's a prototype. Now, I've been on the maglev in Shanghai, which is really cool, but it's not superconducting. But I also want to point out one other thing, is that many of the applications I'm going to show you have been around since the 60s. And in fact, the Japanese had a superconducting maglev train made out of not high temperature superconductors, because they didn't exist then, out of conventional superconductors, one that I'll introduce you to in a few slides. It went about a kilometer, and my Japanese colleagues were very proud of saying that it went just long enough to take our funding agents for a ride. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Then please welcome from the physics department at Ithaca College, Dr. Matthew C. Sullivan and the Quantum Levitator. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Now this is, this is, this is a quantum levitation track, correct? It is indeed. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to help me crush Jimmy with quantum levitation. Nation, as I'm sure you know, quantum levitation refers to the phenomenon whereby the magnetic flux lines flowing through a type two superconductor are pinned in place despite the electromagnetic forces acting upon them. I learned that from the inside of a Snapple cap. <laughs> now, Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Sullivan, can you confirm that if my ice cream quantum levitates, it is undeniably the ice cream of the future? Absolutely. That's just science. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, here we have some of my Americone Dream. It's available in mini cups, which Jimmy's is not, okay? <laughs> and I will confirm, mm, Mm. But it is delicious. <laughs> and now, are you ready to send my ice cream into the future? Certainly. All right. Okay. Ice cream of the future. Engage. <laughs> it's levitating! It's levitating! Hey, put it down for a second. There you go. Whoa. Oh, Jimmy, look. Look, Jimmy. It's levitating. Eat it, Fallon! Eat the future! We'll be right back. Hit it!
Yeah, pretty pr it is actually. So now, now I've uh, taught you enough to you can watch Colbert effectively. So um, anyhow, um, so if, if you I've watched that many times. Matthew told me there's a place where they switch the Americone dream, and I haven't been able to figure that out. If anybody wants to help me, we can do it. Anyhow, why do we need better superconductors? First of all, as I mentioned, we understand the simple BCS theory of superconductivity, but I'm going to show you some of these other quantum mechanical states that have to do with high temperature superconductors are completely not understood. There's all kinds of weird broken symmetries in there. What physicists like to do is look at symmetries and break them. <laughs> it's really fun. And so this is a playground for those things, and there's so many unanswered questions. This was the one with that solved the question of the BCS theory of superconductivity. That's, that solved it. But also, besides just the fundamental physics, which is absolutely gorgeous, there's the application. If you've ever been inside of an MRI, you need a superconducting magnet. You get to go inside of a superconducting magnet. How cool is that? And there's many other applications. Um, they use it for accelerators, the LHC. Um, this is for the ITER project, which is the fusion project that's in France right now, which is promising to giving us a lot of free, cheap energy. Um, and w there's, uh, uh, there are, there are high, high frequency detectors because it also another property of a superconductor is that it's a voltage frequency mixer. So all these things that make it really interesting, and as I mentioned before, for energy, for our power grid, for energy transport, for creating energy in turbines, and for SMES, superconducting magnetic energy sto storage, it would be transformative. But what's the problem? So this is actually a representation of the power grid in the United States. Truthfully, it's the Eisenhower turnpike system, but you know it pretty much maps out what the grid would look like from space. And we see that there's bright spots and dark spots, and that does tell you where the population centers are. Now, the grid has been called by the National Academy of Engineering to be one of the greatest engineering triumphs of the 20th century. Forget that it uses 19th century engineering, but that's pretty interesting. And what we want to do in the future is make use of our energy that we can mine different places in the world. In the United States, we could mine the sun there. We can get wind power here. But then we have to carry it to the population centers, including Tallahassee. And so the problem is that the grid is stressed, but the grid is a clean, excuse me, a clean and sustainable energy carrier. But we have some challenges, and the challenges of the 21st century are outlined here. Capacity, taking all this energy and bringing into New York, Tallahassee, Chicago is a problem, and there's bottlenecks. Another thing which I found very fascinating is that what we lose in resistive losses in the grid every year, that's about, I kid you not, $79 billion a year lost in, res in resistive losses. Much of that is not, we can't help, but we can have an effect on that. Finally, as we start to increase more and more renewables for our global energy challenge and to also not put any more carbon in the atmosphere, we'll be stressing the grid more and more because we'll be putting more and more electrical power through the grid. And right now, something about 40% of our energy is gotten through electrical energy in this country. Now, we have the world's expert in superconducting wire here, David, and, but I'm going to do a little bit of a background. As soon as high temperature superconductors were discovered, people said, let's make wires. Well, it's hard because, in fact, these materials are difficult to work with. They're brittle. They're, they're, like, they're ceramics like a flower pot is a ceramic. So the first generation of wires, which happened very quickly after the discovery, a few years later, was literally pouring in one of these superconductors into a silver sheath and doing a bunch of extruding like this. They weren't great. They weren't malleable. W they didn't stay superconducting if you bent them. But I'm going to show you some pictures of some in-ground applications and that's the kind of superconductors they use. So they already were some success. Later on, a few years later, is what we call the second generation, which is this complicated, multi-layer way of making superconducting flat tapes. These are engineering marvels. <coughs> and what they've accomplished is really terrific. 
And I'll give you one piece of information, which is 2% of the cross-section of this tape is superconducting. There's all these different layers in here. It's only this thing that says YBCO in here that's superconducting. And this is not to scale. 2% of the cross-section is superconducting to make this thing work. Yet that tape still carries five times the power that copper carries at the same temperature. So these are already promising. And Professor Lablastia is looking into using these and maybe other kinds of better, we have to determine if they're better, superconductors to make the world's largest magnets in the world right down the street here. So those are the kind of things we're working on here. Here are the in-ground pictures here. These are mostly that generation one. And I will tell you that at least two of these things don't exist anymore because the Department of Energy in their Office of Electricity decided to cut all the research in superconductivity. But we have hope for this. And let me tell you what these are. This is a transformer station, and this is just an underground wire, and this is another transformer station. So when you see those things, we're going from, you know, what we have in this country is 700 kilovolt long lines, and then you do this thing called transforming down because Mr. Uh, Addison won that it would be AC, is that right? And so we have 110 in our homes, right? Now, there's one thing that just came up a year ago with the National Academy, the National Research Council had a talk where they said they might re revive this particular one. And this is a great thing that's a great application that we can put in right now for superconductors that they're claiming is important for national security. It turns out that we don't have one AC grid in the United States. We have three AC grids that are not connected. We have the Pacific grid, well, I guess the Western Interconnect, the Eastern inter Interconnect, and the Texas Interconnect. And if you know this from your freshman physics, or I'll just tell you, if you have AC circuits and you just try to connect them, you lose a huge amount of energy by connecting these things. It's a killer. So there's no way to connect these. There's something called the Three Amigas Project that would take place in a little town in, uh, I think it's in New Mexico, and what you would do was invert down to DC, underground superconducting cables, and then convert back up to the next grid. Okay? There would be a way to seamlessly connect the three grids. And that we're thinking maybe that'll be revived again. So that's something we're looking at. Besides energy transmission, I mentioned another important thing was the energy production. I have a student in Mexico who's actually doing this in Mexico, and the turbines are fantastic. As you've seen them, they're getting larger and larger and larger. Turbines are now being built the size of 737s. If you use, again, it's localized, so it's easier to cool. It, it's big, though. But if you could make the, the motor, in, or the transformer in the, in, the, in the inside, the motor be out of superconductor, as opposed to a conventional metal, it's one-fifth the weight. That becomes an important concern, and this is quite doable, and there are people being building this. The third application is in what I call these SMEDs. Again, this existed a long time ago, and they we're trying to do this with high-temperature superconductors. This is further back. It's a little harder. There's not as much energy in this, but the idea is that you collect energy in this torus. Okay, just like a, an electromagnet. And the reason why this is so great, if you consider photovoltaics, great to have in Florida. If you have photovoltaics, in the daytime you get a lot of energy, at night you lose it, and this is what we have here. Daytime, nighttime. And also on top of that, they tend to be quite noisy. These SMES devices can actually absorb and spit out energy much more smoothly at a higher th than this. Okay, they're actually faster responding than this noise. So you can imagine to collect energy when you want in the SMEs and bleed it out into the grid when you need it. Okay? And that would really feed into the smart grid capability and also tell you that the thing on your dishwasher that says, if you run your dishwasher now, it will cost $6. If you wait six hours, it will cost $2. Right? And so these are the kind of things we want to incorporate everything we can. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but for those of you that are interested in getting educated, I worked on many of these reports. These are reports that showed us how, what kind of research we need 
to affect our energy security. And these were done by the Department of Energy. And uh, some of the stuff that I'm using came from our 2006 energy report. What we managed to do in this is render down all these books and finally come up with a little short one called New Era that we think were the reason why our Energy Frontier Research Centers were supported. And so it's, it's been a lot of work over many years, but that, that research funding really changed the face of American science. And as I mentioned, I had showed you this graph already. Okay, that's the TC versus time graph. And th these are the conventional superconductors. It's high temperature. These are some other word superconductors. Besides that, this report also identified something that I think is really crucial. When I told you that everything that's read here we understand and everything that's not read we don't understand, everything that's not read we don't understand has this phase diagram. What that phase diagram is, is temperature going up and down here. And this is either pressure or put changing the material, putting electrons or holes in. It's called doping. And what all these materials have is this. The parent compound or the low pressure compound is not a superconductor, but very strange. As you put it under high pressure or put carriers into it, you get something, this thing is a dome. Underneath that dome, the material is superconducting. So all of those materials that aren't those red understood ones have this phase diagram. Another interesting thing, which is a little controversial and I get myself in trouble, we know that out here, these are simple metals. But up here, all of the high temperature superconductors and all of these other materials have very, very strange correlated phases, which we do not understand. I just spent 20 odd years trying to understand what's going on under this dome. And it's my belief that understanding these correlated phases here may help us understand why the high temperature superconductors superconduct, maybe, where else are we going to try, and maybe help us to design new superconductors. So let's go into the history of the designing of superconductors. It all started in 1909, when the race for the cold, where Camelith Onus was working to make things cold. And he liquefied helium. Helium is liquefied very much like the way your refrigerator works or your freezer works, except they use very high pressure helium gas. So after they cooled down to make this liquid helium, his technician, Giles Host, who went on to start Phillips Labs, pretty cool, decided, let's see what happens if we cool down a metal. So in 1911, they took mercury. They randomly took mercury because it's a liquid at room temperature, and they thought maybe it's a good idea to be clean, and so you can boil it up and make it really clean. And also, I have to tell you that for low temperature physicists, you have to have this plot in every single talk you give. It's like a requirement. It's like showing, you know, the cyclotron, you know, you have to show the ring doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, so, what this is showing is that the first publication, the resistance is going down and sunks down to something that was zero. Now, it's easy to show small, but it took many years to show that it was actually zero resistance. Nobody predicted that. These were the th pr three predictions that existed before that. What would happen if you cool this material down? If the resistance will go up, it'll stay the same, it'll go down. Nobody knew. This abrupt drop was a real surprise. But Camerlith Onus went on to discover other important things. Not only was there a critical temperature, but if you put too much current on, there was a critical current above which it wasn't superconducting. And if you put in too much magnetic field, you also killed the superconductivity. And he also decided, I could make SMEs. I can hold energy. And there's a Chicago Tribune article when Cameron Lathonis was visiting Chicago where he says, these SMEs devices could in 1913 solve our world energy crisis. It's a man ahead of his time. Now, the history then went on at Bell Laboratories. Um, someone who many of the people here know, Bert Matias, just went out to serendipitously start mixing things together and creating new materials. He was the first one to create the new strange superconductor. He took something that was cobalt is, is, is magnetic and silicon is a semiconductor, but when you mix them together, it's not magnetic anymore, it's not semiconducting. 
you could make a compound that at low temperature actually superconducts. And he went on to just mix things and try things and, and discovered many new superconductors. And he had his rules. His rules were transition metals, the stuff in the middle of the periodic table, are good. If there's a lot of carriers, that's good. High symmetry is good. Cubic is best. In high temperature superconductors, you want low symmetry. You want really flat, almost two-dimensional materials. Finally, stay away from oxygen, magnetism, insulating phases, and theorists. But what we've learned is the highest temperature superconductors contain oxygen. And I will show you shortly, they're next to magnetic phases. And we're relying very heavily on the theorists right now. Now, if anybody wants a good read, uh, Warren Pickett wrote an article, which I can get you a copy of, or you can get it off the web, which is, what would have happened if Kamerlich Onis didn't use mercury, but he found a chunk of a high temperature superconductor? How would history be different? It's a fun read. Now, I mentioned high critical current is good because things are hard to cool. But John Hume, who's working at Westinghouse, realized that you know you don't just need high critical temperature. I think I said that wrong a second ago. You also need high critical current. And he discovered a material with his graduate student, George Hardy, called an A15. This is a certain crystal structure, A3B. You know, it just got the structure, right? So the, the balls and the sticks are lined up in a certain way. And this has a pretty high critical temperature and keeps that superconductivity even in a good field. It's very, very practical. But I also want to stress that this is a compound. So if you screw up the crystal structure, if you grind it up, it's not going to superconduct anymore. So it's a great superconductor. But then he went on to learn about another superconductor that was discovered in England. And it was called um, uh, niobium titanium. Okay. So Rutherford Labs were using these things. And he turned this into wire and made the first practical superconductor. Niobium titanium is not a compound, it's a random alloy. So you throw in a little niobium, you throw in a little titanium, you melt it up, you mix it up, you sh mix it all around you, and it stays superconducting. And it's malleable. So this is the workhorse of the field. It doesn't have a high critical temperature. It can't maintain its, its um, superconductivity in its high field. But if you get an MRI, if you do any of these things, the LHC, this is the workhorse because it's reliable. So again, keep in mind, a good superconductor also means reliable. And uh, what you can say is that we wouldn't have this without that material. So high TC gets Nobel Prizes. But these kind of materials actually save lives. Now, I will go on to say in this history, I'm going to get a little bit more complicated. But I believe the first high temperature superconductor was in 1986. The first high temperature superconductor was the first time that this specific phase diagram with the dome was found. And it's what we call a heavy Fermion superconductor. Why? Because if you measure the mass of the electrons, it's very large. And this was the first time we realized that that simple electron phonon BCS theory may not work. And we've been studying these ever since. And I believe this was the first high temperature superconductor. And what many of you have learned is that in 2008, after you know, the first cuprate superconductors were discovered in 1986, a new class of high temperature superconductors wasn't discovered until 2008. That was a long time. But that discovery also discovered serendipitously. Hideo Hasano was looking for transparent conductors for other reasons, but he discovered these things serendipitously. But it was a great shot in the arm for my field, because then we thought, if there's two classes of superconductors, maybe there'll be a third. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go on that much longer, but this is an important slide. I don't list all of the great men, but I list many of them. These people discovered superconductors. They had a prediction, and they went after it. They said, this should superconduct. Bednorst and Mueller were, for a certain reason, looking at this material, and they discovered a superconductor. Same thing with M.K. Wu and Paul Chu, and there's other ones up there. I could list several of these discoveries. I know these guys. They're really scary smart. And they work day and night. And they really understand this stuff. And they each have one discovery. Okay. So if you really have a predictive design of a superconductor, 
you're going to be able to have two discoveries. And so this is my argument that fund these people. They have a nose for it. They deserve everything. But also, alongside of that, let's do some of our own computation, predictive design that we're trying to do. And that's my say. Let's work together. It's too hard. World peace. Okay. <coughs> so I don't think I'll have time to go into a lot of this, what is a high temperature a superconductor or not. But what I did say is that all of the high temperature superconductors have this phase diagram. And in fact, just some examples of those are here. Here's many, there's, I can just show at least 45 families of superconductors that have the same phase diagram. And in this same phase diagram, up in the area here, there's a correlated electron phase that we don't understand. For those of you that like high energy physics, here's another example, the quark gluon plasma. It's the same phase diagram where color superconductivity is predicted. And above the hadronic state, which is a normal metal state, no normal conventional state, there's weird things happening. So it's kind of fun to see, uh, is this parallel? Is there something we can uh, hang our hat on? So um, I'm just going to tell you about one phase that I study called the electron pneumatic phase. You may have heard of liquid crystals. They're good for watches, right? And liquid crystals are elongated molecules like this. And in a pneumatic state, they can flow, but they all kind of point in the same direction. What happens in the iron-based superconductors, in most of them, is at a very high temperature, the electrons form these clumps of sausages. Oh, now I'm really hungry. OK. They form these clumps of sausages. So if you look down on the lattice, OK, the crystal looks square. But the electrons glump up like this. And we don't really understand it. And we call it electron nematicity because it looks like a pneumatic liquid crystal. This is another broken symmetry. The underlying lattice is square. The electron fluid is elongated. So the electron fluid doesn't have the fourfold symmetry. It has the twofold symmetry. So it has a lower symmetry than the underlying lattice. That's what we call a broken symmetry, lower symmetry. So what we do is something called point contact spectroscopy. And we study materials like this. And we find all these data. And we found that we can, in fact, map out where it's pneumatic. And so we've applied this to a whole bunch of materials. This is the simplest way to map out where this electron matter is. And when we start designing new superconductors, and by the way, that says that we got a theory for it. This guy helped through the theory. Um, so this is my second last slide before I say goodbye. Um, when we are trying to identify chemical motifs, do a bunch of computation, try to decide what materials we should grow. We start growing materials. I can apply my point contact technique to a parent compound. If it looks correlated, if it has what we find this excess conductance, this peak around zero energy, um, when we measure that, that gives us confidence. Maybe we should do the doping or the high pressure studies to look for a high temperature superconductors. Granted, if we make a new material, we'll throw everything at it. But that's one of the things we'll throw at it. So this is sort of an outline, which I'll be presenting in Washington next week to the DOE, hoping they like what we're doing and the results that we have. But in the meantime, I'm hoping that I gave you a flavor for how exciting and intricate this field is. Correlated electrons is over 60 years old. And I was at the snow mass meeting, you high energy guys. They asked me to speak at the snow mass meeting. And I said to them, the correlated electron problem is the unsolved problem in physics today. Solving this made looking for the Higgs look like a walk in the park. Why? Because you knew where you were going. They knew to build a big enough accelerator. It had to be done. It was really important. It was important to find the mass. But we don't know exactly where we're going in this. And it's really interesting. So just to conclude, the search for new superconductors is full of all kinds of exciting unknowns. And it just. I keep trying to change fields, and I keep coming back because it's so much fun. Better superconductors are needed, and they would transform our lives. And let's work together to try to design new superconductors. And I thank you for your time.